Hey church, today I wanted to talk a little bit about what it means to tithe and why it matters. The word tithe simply means contributing one-tenth. Originally, this would have been crops or livestock, but I'd prefer that no one show up to church next week with a donkey or a goat. If you're wondering why God asks us to give, it's because He wants us to trust Him fully. And that's a lot more intertwined with our money than most of us realize. Here's the thing, God doesn't need our money. He's after our hearts. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24 warns us, No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. Our journey with tithing starts with trust, but there are so many other valuable lessons we learn along the way. The Bible makes it clear that we are called to share with those in need, to look out for the orphans and for the widows, and to be generous in every occasion. We understand His provision isn't about having as much as possible, but helping as much as possible. I hope this helps give you a little more insight on what it means to tithe and why we believe it's so important for our lives. So it's not every week that you go to church and hear ZZ Top, right? I mean, that's... <laughs> Some of the younger people are like, who is that? Who's ZZ Top? Uh, yeah, long beards. Anyway. Uh, well, there's all kinds of things that you're not prepared for when you become a parent. And if you are a parent, you know that. Uh, one of them is being concerned about what children think about you. Uh, it's not something that you thought would ever be a worry in your life, but then all of a sudden you have kids and you find these moments where you actually care what little children think about you. Your kids grow and they get friends and they have birthday parties and, and you don't realize when or how or when it, you know, when it actually happens or why it happens, but you find yourself not just wanting you know, your kids to like you, you find yourself wanting other kids to like your kids, but also to like you. And part of it is for your kids, right? Because you recognize that a piece of other kids liking your kids and wanting to be around your kids is whether or not they like you. But we all know that dad that tries a little too hard to be the fun dad and get all the kids to like him. Anybody know that person? Raise your hand. If you don't know that person, maybe you are that person. Uh, but the truth is, it's something that we all kind of experience or deal with. Uh, a number of years ago, when my daughter Kaylee was really young, I was taking her to preschool, and uh, and we actually had a preschool at our church where we went, and and she went to that preschool, and I remember dropping her off, and like I worked there, and so um, there was all kinds of little kids around, and like we walked, I walked her in, and all the kids were at the fence, and they're talking to her, and these kids that I don't know, and I'm over there like saying hi, and you know, like they know me as Pastor Randy because. I work at the church. And so, and this one little kid that I don't know is like, and she was super nice and totally innocent, but she's like, hey, mister, why, why are you so fat? <laughs> and nobody ever saw that little girl ever again. No, uh, but but no, nobody prepares you for when you're 40 and the rejection of a five-year-old hurts your feelings. Like, I don't, I don't know because I eat too much, I guess. I, I, learn about nutrition. I don't, I don't know what to tell you. But by the time your kids are teenagers, though, if you have teenagers, you're kind of over it. You're just leaning into the whole crusty old guy. I'm not a cool parent and I don't care. You know, like one of the badge of honors I wore as a parent was my oldest son uh, when he was going through high school. Like he was just like, I don't even understand why. Why can't you be like other parents? All my friends, they have cool parents. And I was just like, that's, yes, I'm not a cool parent. That is amazing. That's a dad win. But but we're social creatures from the time that we're born. We're aware of how other people are perceiving us and experiencing us. 
And before we even know what the words mean, we know what acceptance and rejection actually feel like. And I know everybody talks about how they don't care what other people think about them. And it's, but the truth is, it's just how we're wired. Like we, we're wired to be connected to one another. And because we're connected to one another, we care what the people around us think about us. Like, have you ever been around somebody who claimed that they didn't care what other people thought about them, but they claimed it so forcefully and so loudly that it was obvious that they wanted other people to care about the fact that they didn't care about people caring about them. And so last week we began a conversation, this conversation about trophies. And, and it's not really about the obvious ones, but about the invisible ones, the deeper ones that we're all chasing, the ones that are at the core of what it means to be a human being. And so last week we started with the idea of the trophy of being the most influential. And we talked that we had a conversation about power and influence and the purpose that those things give us in our lives and why we chase those down. And, and honestly, that kind of conversation makes a lot of sense. But today, today might, might surprise you a little bit, at least at first, because today's trophy, today's trophy is the most likable. And, um, and it's, it's a beauty queen and she's waving and it's Miss Congeniality, which is a great movie, by the way. And, and, and you might hear that and think like, wait, like what's wrong with being likable? I mean, it's better than the opposite, right? Like nobody wants to win the trophy for most unlikable. And if we're honest, we'd all have to admit that, that we want to be liked by the people around us, at least at some level. And so we present ourselves and we interact with people in a way that reflects that desire to different degrees. I mean, who hasn't changed their shirt before a party because of the way it made you look? Or who hasn't changed their shirt because their wife made them change their shirt before a party because of the way that it made you look? Or, or, or you've had that moment where you thought like, we can't show up to their house empty handed. I mean, that'd be kind of rude or tacky. And so you swing by the store and you pick up a bottle of wine or a flower or plants, whatever to take them over. I mean, at some level, some of it is, feels like it's just being thoughtful and considerate, right? Like, which is what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to be kind when it's part of being a good person. It's part of the social contract. And then on top of that, I mean, there's a lot of places in the Bible that it says things like this, like in Philippians chapter two, verses three and four, it says, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of other people. And, and so it's easy to read that and go, so if I'm just looking out for other people and that's why they like me, then what's the problem? Like, why are we even talking about this? Well, ha have you ever watched someone go overboard on a really good thing though, where it, it became a bad thing? Like one of my friends, um, Chris, he says this all the time. He says, any strength overdone becomes a weakness. And that's true of a lot of things, right? Like too much medicine and it becomes a poison. Like there's a lot of things that you can eat that are really good for you, but you can eat too many of them. A few years ago, we were um, getting ready to go on our very first cruise and we were super excited. And then a few days before, uh, the week before, I just got, I broke out in this massive rash everywhere, which is like, you know, you don't want to get on a cruise ship be, with some sort of like contagious disease and spread it to 5,000 other people, right? So I was like super concerned. And, and so I went to the doctor because I didn't care about the rash. I cared about going on the cruise. I wanted to take a vacation. And, and so I went to the doctor and we started talking about all these tests. And, and, and eventually what they discovered was I had just, I love onions and I had had way too many onions and I had a reaction to how many onions I had had. And I thought, I thought onions were like really good for you. They are good for you. You had too many of them. In a span of tw like 24 hours, I had like so many onions. I don't even know how many, but I'll, I did have a lot. Um, and it was just like, she was like, you kind of smell like onions. I don't know. <laughs> The point is like we've all known or seen people whose need for approval or to be liked made them overthink or over or, or obsess over even like small things, right? Or like, like the guy that his girlfriend doesn't text him back right away. And she's like, I, he's like, I knew it. She's cheating on me. Like it's been five minutes, bro. Like give her a second, you know, or, or someone disagrees with their idea at work and they're just devastated. Everybody hates me. I don't even know why I try. I don't know why I even speak up at meetings. They're probably going to fire me. I hate this place. It was like, dude, they just didn't like your idea. Or they get invited to a party or a social function or to church. And they're just like, nah, I mean, I can't do that. Those people don't like me. And you're like, yeah, but you haven't even met them. And they're just like, yeah, but I can tell. Like, I can just tell they don't like me. See, sometimes we're thoughtful and considerate 
because we're thoughtful and considerate. But if we're honest, sometimes we're thoughtful and considerate because it makes people like and accept us. It, it makes us feel needed and wanted by them, and it makes us feel connected to them. And that is where we start kind of having problems. Because at the core of this conversation about trophies is the idea that we introduced last week is what God calls idols. And, and we just defined an idol this way, is that it's anything or anyone that we look to for things that only God can give us, which is kind of a low bar when you think about it. It's also why this conversation applies to all of us, regardless of our spiritual background, regardless of whether you're somebody that believes in God or you're somebody that's been a Christian all your life. Because for most of us, most of our lives aren't filled with bad things. They're just filled with good things that ultimately get in the way or pull us away from the very best things and ultimately the best thing. And so, so often that has so much to do with why we're chasing after the trophies that we're chasing. So one of the most famous verses in the Old Testament, it actually talks about how God doesn't see us like we see us, that, that we only can look at the outward appearance. And that makes sense because that's all we have, right? We, we, it's not a bad thing that we, that we look at each other and our outward appearance and we make assessments and judgments about that because that's all we can go off of. But it actually says that God looks beyond that, that God actually sees our hearts. He sees our thoughts and our attitudes, our intentions and our motives. And I, I love how Proverbs chapter 16, verse two says it. It says it this way. It says, all a person's ways seem pure to them, but motives are actually weighed by the Lord. See, other people might not be able to see what's driving you. You might not always know exactly what's driving you. You might not always know exactly what your motives are because everything you do makes sense to you. Everybody's decisions, everybody's choices, everything, the life that they've chosen, it makes sense to them. It may even seem pure or good or right to them, but God is actually looking deeper than that. God's looking into our hearts. And what, what I've discovered about myself and, and what I've especially discovered about people who seem obsessed with being liked is that underneath all of the other stuff, whatever it is that's driving them is they just don't feel very likable. In fact, on the surface, for a lot of us, our desire for approval may look like it's just, we're just wanting to be liked, but underneath it, we're actually terrified of rejection, of loneliness, of being completely dismissed or left alone. And maybe you're here this morning and you know exactly what I'm talking about. You know exactly what it feels like because you had that experience in your family or you had that experience when you were a kid. The truth is most of us are in denial about how much other people's opinions and feelings drive us and what we do. And so I, I thought I'd, before we dive into this particular Bible story, I thought I'd take a minute and maybe try to put a little bit more skin on it. Because honestly, even if you're somebody who can't relate to this stuff, it's almost guaranteed somebody that you love, somebody that you care about, somebody you're related to, somebody that is in your, is in your life, actually can. So see if, see if this sounds like anyone you love. Now, not, not all of this means that, you know, if, if some of this fits you, not all of it means that you're like controlled by what people think of you or you're controlled by approval, but it's just sort of painting the picture. See, because we think about it, somebody that's just super needy or clingy or somebody that makes terrible decisions because they're just consumed with whatever people around them are doing. But people that this is true of, one of their primary love languages is words of affirmation. They absolutely thrive on it, which is nothing wrong with that. That's just how they're wired. The problem is that they, they are wired that way, but they have trouble accepting it. Have you ever known somebody that, that just, they're really good at encouraging and giving praise, but then you try to give it back to them and they're just like super awkward and weird about it. People with, they, they often fixate on becoming what the other person wants them to become as a way of showing them love. They don't even realize that, that, that they're actually abandoning themselves. That they're just trying to show that other person love. They're constantly hustling to prove their value and their worth. It can be like pulling teeth to know what they actually like because they always defer to whatever the other person or the group wants or the, what the group likes. They're often easygoing and low maintenance. Expressing even a small opinion or preference feels risky to them. And so they really don't want to make decisions, especially decisions that impact other people. It usually comes out when you're trying to decide where to go to eat. Have you ever talked to somebody, been around somebody where they're terrified to be the one to pick the place because what if nobody likes it? 
People are often distrusting of others. They assume that you don't actually like them or enjoy them. You're just kind of tolerating them, that you're useful to them. And that's the cruel irony is that they can never seem to accept what it is that they want the most, even when it's being given to them. Under all of it is the driving questions of, do you, do you like me for me? Do you love me for me? Do you want me around for me? Their inner critic is so loud. Any criticism from you feels like a death blow because it only proves that the inner critic was right about them all along. When the people they love or care about are upset, they immediately move in to fix it. They don't want to be a burden, so they neglect their own needs. Admitting that they have needs makes them feel needy. As a result, they often feel taken advantage of by others, but they'd never say that to them. They tend to catastrophize when things don't go their way. They'd rather be accepted for who they aren't than rejected for who they are. Whew, man, that is such a heavy, heavy reality. Now, it's not all dark. It's not all bad. All that sensitivity to other people also produces some extraordinary strengths. When people that are wired like this, when they're dialed in, they can, they're so attentive and present that they make the other person across from them feel like they're the only person in the world who matters at that moment, which is incredible. They're exceptional at seeing and connecting and including and empathizing with other people. People feel safe with them, being around them, being themselves almost immediately. They say things like, I don't really know why I'm telling you this. I don't, I'm just, and they just start sharing some deep part of their life or their story. They're often doers and problem solvers. They're good at calming other people down. The crazy thing is, despite all their fears, they're almost always really well liked. In fact, some of the people that you like the most are probably the ones who are most afraid that they're completely unlikable. So there's a story in the Old Testament where we see all of this kind of stuff play out in a destructive way. It's one of the key stories in the scriptures. It's one where God frees his people from slavery in Egypt and he leads them across the desert to a beautiful land that he promised them. And in that journey, they're learning what it means to be his people and what it looks like to follow and to live for him. And it's when they get the 10 commandments and they develop these rhythms and rules and routines and rituals, some of which are still a part of our faith experience and how we connect with God today. But the whole story begins with God telling this guy, Moses, that he wants him to be the leader. But Moses doesn't want to do it, and he begs God to choose somebody else. And so they have a little conversation about it, and this is how it goes. It's found in Exodus chapter 4. We're going to begin with verse 10. But Moses pleaded with the Lord. God's already said, look, I've chosen you. I want you to go to Egypt and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And and Moses is like, Lord, I, I, I'm not very good with words. I've never been, and I'm not now. Even though you've spoken to me, I get tongue-tied, and my words get tangled. And then the Lord became angry with Moses. All right, he said, what about your brother, Aaron the Levite? I know he speaks well, and look, he's on his way to meet you now. He'll be delighted to see you. Verse 16, Aaron, God, this is still God speaking, Aaron will be your spokesman to the people and he will be your mouthpiece and you will stand in the place of God for him, telling him what to say. So God chooses Moses and Moses is like, I'm not your guy. Like the last time, like I got involved in this kind of thing, it was a disaster. I, you know, I ended up killing a guy. I didn't want to kill the guy. I'm not super good with people. Every time I talk to people about stuff, it just comes out wrong. And I mostly come off kind of as angry. Just pick somebody else. And, and I, don't, I don't know like how you imagine this going, but like having had a relationship with God, it, it's, it's difficult for me to just imagine, like at this point in this conversation, God is, God, God has not only answered all of Moses' questions and his fears, he's, he's actually done some pretty remarkable like miracles like just before this because Moses is like, I can't do it. I'm not powerful enough. And God's just like, stick your hand in your cloak. And he does and he pulls it out and he's got leprosy and he's like, stick it back in. He pulls it out, it's completely healed. God, God's doing all this stuff to prove him like, hey, I got it. You don't, I just need you to go and talk. Moses is still like, one, two, three, not it. Like, I'm not doing it. So, so yes, God is a little bit frustrated. And so God's like, fine, okay, you're still gonna do it. But look, here comes your brother, Aaron, and he's a talker, he's the guy. So we're gonna, we're gonna have him be the one to sort of step up and be the mouthpiece. And you just, you just tell him what I'm telling you to say. And, and why was Aaron a good choice? Well, because unlike Moses, people really liked Aaron. They feared and respected Moses 
but they liked his brother Aaron. He's the personality in the family. He's persuasive. He's good at winning people over. He doesn't always make the best decisions, but they got each other and they're gonna make a great team and it works. It's fantastic. It's great. See, when we read these stories, Moses gets all the credit in the telling of these stories when you read the Bible, but without Aaron, because, because Moses was refusing to, to do it, like the Jewish people wouldn't have followed Moses across the street, much less across the desert, much less across the desert. And so after they leave Egypt, they're out in the desert and Moses leaves to go spend, God, spend time with God up on the mountain. And he leaves Aaron in charge, which is great at first, but because, you know, everybody likes Aaron. And then Moses is, is gone longer than, he's, than anybody expected. And so people start getting restless and they do what people always do. They attack the person that's right in front of them, that's in charge, whether they can do something about it or not. For instance, have you ever been in a situation at an airport where flights get canceled and people are stranded and people are patient for a little while and everybody's just like making the best of it. And then there's a point where it drags on too long and the longer it drags on, they just start losing it. And who do they take it out on? They take it out on the person, the airline employee right in front of them, the gate agent, the person that's at the ticket counter, who are, whoever. And they're not even mad at those people. And they know it's not their fault, but it doesn't matter. They're mad, they're unhappy, and they want somebody to do something about it. So for Aaron, he doesn't just have a couple hundred sort of grumpy airline passengers that, he, he, uh, that are you know, complaining to him. He's surrounded by an entire nation of crazy people who are upset, like, where's our leader? What's going on? Why isn't God here? What's happening? And so look at what happens between Aaron and the people in Exodus 32. It says, when the people saw how long it was taking Moses to come back down the mountain, they gathered around Aaron. Come on, they said, make us some gods who can lead us. We don't know what happened to this fellow Moses who brought us, brought us here out of the land of Egypt. So Aaron said, take the gold ring from the ears of your wives and sons and daughters and bring them to me. All of the people took the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. And then Aaron took the gold, melted it down and molded it into the shape of a calf. When the people saw it, they exclaimed, oh, Israel, these are the gods who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Can you just imagine what God's thinking in this thing? Like, okay. Verse five. Aaron saw how excited the people were. And so he built an altar in front of the calf. And then he announced, tomorrow will be a festival to the Lord. So here's the thing. Aaron knows this is a bad idea. He does. The problem is all of the positive stuff that landed him in the position of leadership in this moment actually has a dark side, just like all of us. And so he's driven by this deep need for approval to be liked. And that is his kryptonite. It's crazy to me and kind of funny how quickly he just kind of gets swept away and carried away with it, right? Because it says he doesn't just make the calf, which was a bad idea. When he saw how excited the people were, how much that he, they loved what he had done, he's like, dude, I'm the man. So then he built an altar in front of it and he's like, hey, Tomorrow we party, people. And this may be a calf, but it's going to be a party for God. And they did. They threw a giant party, a giant festival. And everybody loves, everybody loves it. Everybody loves the festival and everybody loves him. But then Moses comes back. And they're all caught. And the whole thing comes crashing down. And so Moses is just livid. If you know the story, Moses is bringing the Ten Commandments down and he's so mad, he throws them on the ground and breaks them, uh, which probably wasn't, you know, the greatest choice when you're trying to keep people from thinking that you're just like this angry rage monster and then you rage out every time. That's probably not helping your, you know, uh, what people perceive about you. And so Moses goes off and he's just giving it to everybody and another thing and God and how dare you and I mean you he's and then when he's done going off on all the people he turns to his brother and this is what it says in verse 21 it says finally he turned to Aaron and he demanded what did these people do to you to make make you bring such terrible sin upon them what did they do to you Aaron Aaron's like don't get upset my lord you yourself know how evil these people are. They said to me, make us gods who will lead us. We don't know what happened to this guy, Moses, this joker that brought us out of Egypt. 
who brought us out here. And so I just told them, look, whoever's got any gold jewelry, just take it off. And when they brought it to me, I threw it in the fire and out came this calf. I don't even know what happened. This is such a great story. I mean, Aaron, this dude, he's, he's smooth, right? He's like, you can tell this is a guy who's talked his way out of everything. You know any of those people? I wish I was, I wish I had a little more of that, especially when I get pulled over. <laughs> I've never gotten let off a single time. And my wife, on the other hand, when she's gotten pulled over by the end of the exchange, the cop not only is not giving her a ticket, he's telling her what a good driver she is and she should not be influenced by all the bad drivers. <laughs> That is a true story. I'm like, I have never wanted somebody to get a ticket so badly in my life as I want you to get a ticket. So Aaron's like, look, man, I, I know you're a dude. Just relax. It wasn't me. It was all them, man. I'm on your side. I was just trying to keep it from getting out of hand. You know how these people are. You should have seen them. They were maniacs and they were not happy with you. Honestly, I just did this for you. You should be thanking me. You know, like, you know, somebody's in the crowd's like, hey man, you built the calf. And Moses is like, what was that? Aaron's like, nothing, nothing. Some guy just spouting off over there. Moses is like, did he say something about the calf? No, no, no. He said he likes your staff. Like he's really, really impressed with that stick you have. See, some of us read this, and even if we don't really get why the calf was a big deal, we, we can understand why Moses is ang- why, why he's angry with his brother. I mean, you can't help but read this and be like, what the heck? Like, don't you actually have any principles? Don't you have any sort of compass, Aaron? And the truth is he did. It was approval. It was fear of rejection. That was his compass. Um, one of the interesting things that is true when you are in ministry and you've been a pastor, and I tell you this because I'm, I'm good. I tell you this not so you'll feel bad for me. I don't want you to feel bad for me. I'm, I'm fine. But I tell you this because I, I've experienced moments like this. We had been a, we started a church in 2007. We had been there for five or six years. And um, there just a whole bunch of stuff happened. And people started saying and doing really terrible things about me and my family in public at gas stations, around town, on social media. And, um, and man, it, second guessing things and just making accusations that were ridiculous, that weren't true, but just stirring people up and people that there were just minor like disagreements that they had worked at the church. And I didn't even know what they were upset about, but they left upset. And rather than come talk to me, they just like stirred up all these people and started rallying all these people to do all kinds of crazy stuff. And I did my best. Mo- most people like didn't really even know what was going on. Most people in our church, um, but it, it was crazy and toxic in so many different ways at different times. Uh, and it was really, really hard. It was really hard. And, and <clears throat> And the worst part was my kids, my two older kids got exposed to all that and just how crazy and ugly Christian people can be. Um, and and I, I've kind of prided myself, like I'm pretty thick skinned. It You have to work really hard to hurt my feelings. In fact, most of the time, my assumption is if you say something mean or you treat me rude, my assumption is like, that's a you problem, buddy. I didn't do nothing. You know, like I just, that's my default. Um, so you have to try really hard to hurt me. But it, there was a lot of things that were done and said that really hurt me and hurt my family. And so um, I, I didn't realize it. I didn't know what, what happened, but I just started kind of like packing on this armor, you know, and sort of insulating myself against, defending myself against all of those attacks and all of those terrible things that people were saying and all of those things that people were doing. And, and I have no idea when it happened but I only discovered it much later looking back, but I started leading scared. 
second guessing all of my decisions. And when I first started pastoring, man, I was invincible. Not because I thought I was perfect, but be just got, I was so connected with God and so sure of what we were doing and so sure of what he'd called me to do that it didn't matter what anybody else said. That he, what he was telling me to do and what he was, his opinion of what was happening was the only thing that mattered. Five, six years later though, I was not invincible. It had been, I'd been beaten into the ground. And so I was worrying about every little decision and how would it be perceived? And because it wasn't just affecting me, it was affecting our church, it was affecting all this stuff. See, the truth is when you peek behind our greatest trophies, what you find is almost always our greatest fears and our deepest wounds that we chase after the things that we think will give us value and purpose and meaning and healing. And so we spend all of our time trying to prove ourselves to ourselves and prove ourselves to a dad that didn't pay attention to us or to a parent that rejected us or to whoever, right? We, we spend all of our time trying to prove that all the naysayers were wrong. So when you peek behind our greatest trophies, it's almost always our greatest fears and deepest wounds. And God actually knows this about us, which is why he confronts us with this conversation about idols. Not because he's just like, look, I can't tolerate you having anything. He's just saying, you don't have to live like that. Let, let me move into the deeper part of your soul and begin to heal you from the inside out. Because when you do that, this stuff will no longer control you. See, I, I think so often when we talk about God and what he wants, we paint him as a God who's obsessed with getting us to listen to him and obey him, that he's just trying to get us to straighten up and stop sinning and stop paying attention to other things and just focus on him. But when you actually read the scriptures, obedience is not God's end game for us. Freedom and life is God's end game for us. Every time God talks to us in the scriptures about obeying him, it's always in the context of our freedom and what's best for us. And that's the best part, that God's solution to these idols, these trophies in our life, it isn't him wagging his finger at us. It isn't him judging and lecturing us. It's him moving into those places and beginning to meet our deepest needs and calming our deepest fears and, and healing our greatest wounds. And so if you're somebody who's driven by a longing for approval, I want you to know that you have a perfect heavenly father who doesn't just love you. He likes you, that he created you, that he is moving towards you. In her book, um, Braving the Wilderness, Brene Brown, who I love, she wrote this. She said, true belonging doesn't require us to change who we are. It requires us to be who we are, which is such an incredible truth. But it also begs the question, well, then who are we? In 1 John chapter 3, John, who was one of Jesus's inner circle, one of his closest friends and disciples, John takes a stab at it and nails it by telling us who we are. This is what he says. He says, see what great love the father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. That's what you are. That's who you are. I know a lot of us get uncomfortable with that imagery of God being our father because of who our father was or is or wasn't. But you can know that your heavenly father is loving and perfect. And he didn't just make you, he handpicked you to adopt you into his family. In fact, that's the picture that the New Testament paints for us over and over and over again. In Ephesians chapter one, verses four and five, the apostle Paul who wrote this letter to this church wrote these words. He says, even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes that God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. 
This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. See, before he made you, before he made the world, he loved you and he chose you. He knew how it was all going to go before he even got started, and he did it anyway, and he pre decided to adopt us into his family. That part of this always gets me. It gets me every time because all four of our kids are adopted. Every single one of them has a unique story, but here's what's true of every one of them they were chosen. They were chosen. It didn't matter how jacked up their story was, how jacked up their circumstances were. We wanted them in our family. We wanted to be their mom and dad. We didn't research and interview them, you know, sit down, weigh out the pros and God, tell me what could you bring to the Sherwood family if you were gonna be my son, right? No, we just loved them. They didn't earn adoption. They didn't behave their way into our family and they can't misbehave their way out. I'm their dad. See, your worth comes from what God says about you, not from the approval of the people around you. And Jesus, so he lovingly invites us to live for the approval of one instead of everyone. But it gets so sideways for us, which is exactly what I was describing in the story about me is it started out and I was living for the approval of one, but eventually I took so many hits. I started living for the approval of everyone and it's a prison. It's only when we actually begin to step into that and live into that, that we actually begin to truly live free. So, What are you going to do? What are you going to do about the approval and the likes? Laying Laying down that idol, giving up that trophy, certainly not easy. And certainly is a journey. We're tempted every day to go back to it, to find our value and our worth and our meaning and what other people think and feel and say about us. And so... I I jotted down just a couple of thoughts I want to give you here. And then we have one scripture I want to give you at the end before I let you go. Some of this is going to seem incredibly unspiritual. I don't care. (laughs) Let me just give you a couple of practical things. Number one, this is the, this is the most important one. This is the place to start. Internalize what God says about you in his word. If you're going to actually allow him to begin to heal all that stuff inside of you where you're out there trying to prove yourself all the time. It starts with internalizing what God says about you because what God says about you is the only thing that matters. Start with the verses that I've given you today. We talked about last week, how every single week, this, this uh, month in this conversation, we're going to have one verse that we're trying to memorize for us. It's that first John chapter three, verse one, read it every day. Think about it. Talk to God about it. Internalize what God says about you. Secondly, learn about and lean into your God-given uniqueness. God has wired you and your story has shaped you and the people that you've loved and who have loved you. There's a uniqueness about who you are that God has given to you and only you. And you actually have to begin to understand who you are. Thirdly, when people who know you tell you that they like you, just choose to believe them. You get to choose whether or not you believe what people are saying, right? It sounds simple, but it ain't easy, especially if if this is an issue for you. Fourth or fifth or whatever, make peace with the fact that you're not everybody's cup of tea and you're not supposed to be. There's 8 billion people on earth. Chances are good. They ain't all going to vibe with you. And then lastly, stop doing stuff to make other people like you that makes you not like you. So many times we're willing to sacrifice, and I'm not even talking about immoral stuff or what, but so many times we're, we're willing to sacrifice or suppress part of ourself so that we fit in or we gain the approval of that guy or our boss or this friend or our neighbor or whatever. When I became a pastor, Every pastor I've ever known in life plays golf. And 
I decided, I guess that's what I got to do. I got to learn to play golf. And so for the first few years I was a pastor, I pretended to like golf. And it sounds stupid, but it was like, it was just this peer pressure thing. And so when pastors get together, they play golf. Golf is the dumbest, as far as I'm concerned, is the (laughs) dumbest waste of time and money ever. And I hated every second of it. And so then, you know what I started doing when we'd go on these retreats? All the, all the pastors, all the husbands would go play golf and I would go with all the wives to the spa and get a massage. <laughs> it was awesome. Way better than playing golf. They would show up all frustrated. I'd show up all relaxed. Let, let me show you the goal of this whole thing. First Thessalonians chapter two, verse four. This is the same guy that wrote Ephesians, the apostle Paul, he's talking. He says, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We're not trying to please, um, we are not trying to please people, but God who tests our hearts. He said, we're not trying to please God so that he'll approve of us. We're trying to please God because he's already approved of us. We're not trying to earn God's approval and, and, you know, live our life perfect so he'll, he'll accept us and approve us. No, he's going like, we've already been accepted and loved and adopted into his family and approved by him. So we actually just get to go live and live in a way that pleases and honors him because we're free. We're free from having to earn all that. And that's the place that God wants you to get to. And that's what I want to pray into your life and into my life today. If, if, you're a follower, if you're a follower of Jesus, man, this is such a huge, huge deal. We don't have time to, to, to go all the way into it. But I want to encourage you, go back and read the Exodus story. Because most of the time we look at it and we're just like, of course, like God was upset. Like they were worshiping a calf instead of him. But go back and look at the things they said. They said they built the calf and they said, let's throw a festival for the Lord, right? They just mixed it all into their, their faith and relationship with God. And, and that's, that's what's so insidious about this stuff because it's driving us that we, it's not that God's not afraid that you're gonna build an altar in your house to money and you know, get down and pray to it. No, but you know what happens? We just mix all that stuff into our life and we just mix it into our faith and we just mix the approval stuff in there and it just gets incorporated. And before you know it, we're like pulled away from the one that we say it's all about. If you are not a follower of Jesus, man, I, 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 God wants you to know that he's inviting you into his family, that he wants to adopt you as his son, as his daughter, to be your father, that you can experience the overwhelming love of Jesus, the overwhelming life that he came to bring. That's what he wants to give you. Let's pray together. God, we... um. This is one of those uh, trophies. This is one of those idols, if you will. It's really hard to see in the mirror because we have justifications for why we do all the things that we do. We've been serving those needs and those wounds. And part of the way that we've worked around them is we've leveraged them for good. For some of us, the, some of the success we've experienced in our life is because we've been able to be so in tune with other people, so perceptive of what other people are thinking and feeling about us and about situations that we've leveraged that in our favor to be good, to deliver results And so it's difficult, God. But in a moment of honesty, Lord, we'd all have to say that there's a striving in our soul, a sense of earning, a sense of proving to ourselves and to you, to some coach who's long been gone in our lives, to some parent, some adult 
some person in our life, in our story, proving to them that we belong, that they were wrong, that we have value and worth. God, you step into that conversation and invite us to come running into your arms, to lay down that trophy, to lay down that idol and receive your love and receive your approval and receive your acceptance and your grace and to be adopted as your child into your family. That we didn't do anything to earn that adoption. You paid for it with your life, Jesus. We didn't behave our way into your family. And so we don't have to behave to stay in your family. We can receive your freedom and your life because when we've been set free, when we experience that approval, our response is to love you in return, to live a life that's pleasing to you. God, thank you for caring so deeply about who we are at our core, about the things that have shaped us and changed us and wounded us. But we pray, God, that as you speak into those places in our soul, God, that we would just surrender to you. Lord, for those of us that are Jesus followers, God, would you open our eyes where so much of this stuff just kind of been mixed into what we think of as our faith. It's good stuff pulling us away from, distracting us from the freedom of what's best. That we're not just living for the approval of one. But if we're honest, we're living for the approval of a whole bunch of people. For those that have been just exploring and asking questions. God, they got a lot of stuff from their past. A lot of baggage they've carried, some things that people have said and done to them, maybe in a church setting even. And that stuff has been in the way between you and them. I pray, God, that you would push through all of that. You would step into the space of their soul begin to whisper to them, inviting them into a relationship with you, pressing against the very core of who they are, speaking life and love. So Lord, as fully as we know how to do, we open our hearts and our lives to you and we surrender them to you. And we invite you to come and heal us and make us whole. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for bringing us into your family. In your name we pray. Amen. South Hills Church, I just want to take a moment and say thank you for watching our service online. Whether you're watching it for the first time or you're watching it again because you enjoyed the service so much from the weekend, I'd like to take a moment and dive into our giving. Every week we give people the opportunity to give back and give to the local church so that God can continue to bless your lives and bless your finances. Here at South Hills, we believe that everything comes from God. We believe that He's the one that chose us and brought us into this world, gave us our gifts and talents and abilities. And I just want you to know that when we give, we are giving back what God has already given to us. If you've ever seen any of our envelopes at a South Hills campus, you'll see on there that it says, every week at South Hills, your generosity is giving people the opportunity to live a better story. And there's a scripture on there in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21 that says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So I want to encourage you today to click down below and set up your giving, whether it's for the first time or whether you're doing reoccurring giving. We have four ways to give here at South Hills. One, you can do it in person at any of our campuses through an envelope. Or two, you can actually text any amount that you would like to to 84321 
one. And the third way is to download our Church Center app. I encourage you to do this one because a Church Center app gives you opportunity to stay connected with our church and your campuses. It's a great tool and resource for you to know what's going on. And the fourth way to give is to give online. You can go to southhills.org slash give and you can set up your giving there. Whether you're a guest of our church or whether you are a member of our church, whether you simply just like to watch our services, I encourage you to trust God with your finances so that he can bless and anoint your finances and you can be trusting God in this journey of living life to the fullest. I love you and thank you for watching our online service today.